The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. And the Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And today we are very lucky because we have Derek Severs here with us. Um, I'll read his me in 10 second bio. He's, he's the man waving in the very dapper uh, outfit right now. Um, he says, I'm a musician, producer, circus performer, entrepreneur, TED speaker, and book publisher, monomaniac. Um, curious it sounds kind of sexy or, or kinky i want to find out what that means uh, introvert slow thinker and love finding a different point of view uh he's the founder and former president of cd baby and he's the author of anything you want most recently hell yeah or no and the upcoming book how to live um so if you've been here before you know the drill uh throw questions in the chat uh i'll call you and meet yourself ask it to derek uh if you don't want to be on youtube uh, just indicate that right on your behalf and we'll probably just pivot to q a uh, right away so just start throwing them now that being said, Derek, how are you doing today? Oh, here, I put you on mute. Uh, there you go. Okay, you can hear me now? I can hear you. All right, hey everybody. Um, by the way, you know, all those things you just said about me, they're actually all past tense. I, I think my, my me in 10 seconds actually says I was oh, yes, yes, entrepreneur. I have been an entrepreneur and a musician. There was a thing, uh, a couple of years ago when I realized that most of us hold on to titles longer than we should because I'm not really an entrepreneur anymore. I've been calling myself an entrepreneur, but like actually I started a company, what, 23 years ago and I sold it 13 years ago and I haven't really started a company since then. I mean, I've published books, but I wasn't trying to make money from it, you know? So it's like, I thought about how just because somebody was a high school athlete doesn't mean they could keep calling themselves an athlete forever. Like at some point that title expires. So I went to my bio and my site and I changed it to past tense. Instead of saying, I am these things, I was like, I was these things. Right. What am I now? I don't know. We'll see. And and I imagine given what you just said, you don't carry a label. Uh, and you don't hold on and you don't hold on to any too tightly. Um, but is there any that resonates with you right now? Like uh an artist of life or, or something jazzy like that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> By the way, Peter, I love how mellow you are. You know how everybody, it's like when they get on a mic, they're just like, okay, ladies and gentlemen, you know what I'm saying? All right, people, you know, they like kind of churn up this adrenaline. I like how you're just like, yeah, hey, so uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, title you're using now. Um, so uh, no, I think um, right now I feel like I'm only an author or a writer, whichever word, doesn't matter to me. But I feel that up until a year or two ago, I thought of myself as a programmer and an entrepreneur that would sometimes write what I had learned and share it on my blog. And now I feel like I really, really, really like writing. I think it's the most interesting thing to talk about ideas and dive into ideas. And if I make that my main job definition, then that means I have to do more of that and do it better. I was like, yeah, this is the only thing I want to do now. Uh, but yeah, now I'm just a writer. Yeah. And what I got from you is that what you identify with, uh, it's almost like you have to live up to that identity. And this seems like you're using it in a positive sense. Like, you know what? I love writing. Let's call myself a writer. Make me do yeah. it better. Yeah. Years ago when I was a teenager, and we used to make business cards. Do you remember business cards? Do we still do those anymore? Hey, maybe, yeah. yeah. Um, but I had a business card because I was trying to be a freelance musician in New York City. And so at first I just played guitar and then I started playing bass because it's almost the same. And then I started taking piano lessons and really taking piano seriously. So what I did is I, I added piano to my business card. So now anybody I was meeting and handing my card, it's like, okay, I'm on the hook now. I have defined myself as also a piano player and I started getting gigs as a pianist. And so I felt like defining myself as such meant I had to rise to the title. Yeah, I like that. And, and to circle back to your, your writing practice, um, I'm curious, what's your ritual? You wake up first thing in the morning, uh, you're just it's random, do you have anything? I, I 
it's such a difference between in theory and in practice. In theory, I would love to be a ritual guy. I would love to tell you that every morning at 7.58, I do such and such, and by 8 a.m. that, and I do this until one. Uh, in theory, yes. In practice, no. Um, not at all. Mm -hmm. Every day is different. So uh, I was like, you're in a Zoom room with a bunch of like good-looking strangers that get horny over the word meta. Uh, so given this, this context, <laughs> any, any thoughts you'd want to share with us about yourself or in general, um, like maybe what's a lie for you at the edge of your thinking? A lie at the edge uh, of my thinking? Uh, a, a lie for you. Oh, like a, a lie. A lie. Oh, or, or a lie. A lie <laughs> if, at if the edge of my thinking. That would be a fun one, wouldn't it? <laughs> Especially as like a welcome question. What's a lie? At the edge of my <laughs> Hold on. Let's see. Um, I wonder if I could answer both of those. Um, Maybe they're the same answer. Yeah. I mean, there's the, it's funny, there's a public versus private. No, I don't know. Uh, the, okay, do you mean just kind of like, was that a, a nice way of, a poetic way of saying what's on my mind? Yes, okay. pretty much. <laughs> I was just thinking earlier today about the public and private balance. Um, I was talking with someone else who also has the same tendency as me, which is to feel the need to dive in 100% to one thing or 100% into another thing. So therefore, like a very black and white approach. And she asked me, um, she said, well, what about having a kid? Like once you have a kid, I mean, that kind of means you need to put your whole career on hold and your work life is on hold because your kid is your top priority now. So if and I said, no, 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 no. I said, yeah, my kid is my top priority, but it's got to be a balance between public and private. Like if if I was like 100% private life and I did nothing in the public, that would be really sad to me. But on the other hand, if I was 100% public life and had no private life, that would also be really sad. So no, um, I mean, my kid's only eight years old. So I've only been doing this for eight years. I'm no big expert, but um, I really like this idea of saying and not or to things and not thinking we need to pick one or the other. Um, and each of us finding our balance, whether, you know, in my case, like the public private thing, it's finding like, I like for about 40% of my life to be public and 60% private or whatever it may be. And I was thinking of the metaphor of the country house and city apartment, uh, meaning there's kind of a centuries long tradition for those that can afford it to have an apartment in the city and a house in the country. So it's not either or, you don't have to ask yourself, do I want to live in the city or do I want to live in the country? For hundreds of years, people have been doing this thing where they have a little apartment um, in London and a house up in Gloucestershire somewhere, uh, or it's the a little apartment in Vienna and a house out there, or whatever. Like the, it's, I, I'm thinking about that metaphorically, that that's the and answer to where to live, that you don't have to pick one or the other, that you can set up your life in such a way that you can have your city apartment and your country house and say yes to both, because you don't need to dis, you don't need to deny any aspect of your personality or your needs, that you could say yes to them and just find out how to make the balance. So yeah, there is a, uh, there's something alive at the edge of my thinking that's not a lie. Ever, like what came to mind there is uh, like say these dichotomies that pop up in our mind uh, and then this idea of like getting into right relationship with them. And so like the private versus public, for example, um, I publicly came out really as a stoic since COVID online came online. Um, and I'm finding like, just like my avatar and the spectacle, if you will, you know, is making me become more stoic and virtuous in my, my daily life. Because people are seeing that like, oh, should I gotta live up to it? So it's like the identity piece. Um, and I feel like the right relationship with private and public is slowly coming into place right here. So do, mm. do you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, okay, so what you just said, like I came out as a stoic, it's like, there's probably some parts of you that disagree or not aligned with stoicism as an ism. Uh, and so the this whole idea of isms, this need to subscribe all the way in. Uh, maybe I've just kind of have a, a bad association with isms, but when I think of like 
anything that ends with ism. It's it's this kind of all in subscription uh, to something, um, which reminds me of when I lived in Santa Monica, California for a few years, everybody in Santa Monica, California is into yoga and not just doing yoga, not just, you know, a downward dog and doing it and enjoying the physical thing. They go all into this whole culture of it where everything just becomes namaste and they all drink the same kind of matcha thing and they all wear the same stuff and they carry their mats around and now they take on this new lifestyle where everything in their house is suddenly bamboo with little but it's and it's just this this need to go all into an identity and go this is me now that was the old me this is the real me this is the new me and that's kind of an ism it's it's buying in all the way um whereas i think the and not or thing can apply to this too you can say i like stoicism i believe in what they're saying. I believe this is a great way to be. And <laughs> I also do some things which are completely counter to it. And I like those things too. That you don't have to pick just one philosophy and say, this is it for me. You can, um, you can listen to ACDC and WC. <laughs> you don't have to pick one. Yeah, uh, I think we're going to call ourselves the weird Stoics here because we're doing exactly that, having all these like philosophy sex with all these different, you know, reality tunnels here. Um, mm. So that does, does resonate. Um, so I'm not going to hog you anymore. Uh, so I'm going to pivot to the Q&A. Uh, I've been trying not to look down, but it's funny. The uh, It was a Victor that said something like, oh, yes, I enjoy my little apartment and my posh mansion. <laughs> I was like, okay, I can't look down. I'm going to laugh too much. But yeah. Yeah, the chats, the chats will get you in trouble. Um and the title of this 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 event was like uh, entrepreneurialism and uh, the spiritual. I don't know what it was, but yeah, we don't no we don't have to talk. Yeah, no. <laughs> we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> Thank um, you for making a title, but we don't need to. Yeah. Get here to it. Uh, Cody, you are up. Um, thanks. There's something that that's it's it's like really alive, and like I think I wrote a question in there mainly just to get your attention, Peter, because I actually like you two talking to each other. And in the, the first conversation I had with you, Peter, I was like, man, you should get Derek on here because you said something really awesome that was like, and you're like, yeah, I've already talked to Derek. And I'm like, all right, well, perfect. Because he said something really awesome when you're thinking and you're still, I, I, I watch your, read your newsletters and I watch you think about what the stoa is and like what you're, what a steward of the stoa is and like this, this, how it's different than rebel wisdom and this kind of guerrilla punk rock atmosphere that this thing has. And so its identity seems to be like alive and just what you two are talking about this like this identity that's like not an identity you know it's like it's 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 playing these dualities and and at the same time like this thing needs to sustain ideally sustains peter so that we can keep having this place and peter doesn't have to like go do other things and we like all have to pick up the pieces and we'll do it poorly probably um so where is the can you provide some wisdom I'm like, can you give peter some wisdom and us all some wisdom that we can support him and also mm. like in this world that's like this isn't a corporation this isn't a business but it is somehow trying to make a living you know so it has its own mm. like identity crisis um mm. how do we and it's doing well it's doing well is it Peter? Is it going all right? Peter, 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 add some more in here. It's, it's going all right. Yeah. Good, see, all right. All right is not all, all right's not good enough. <laughs> well, no, I mean, okay, the real question was, is it sustainable mm. as it is now? Um, yeah, it's, it's a big question because we've only been around for um seven months really, and mm -hmm. about uh 200 people are supporting on Patreon and it's increasing. Um, I'm not really thinking about livelihood too much uh, but i think mm -hmm. it will eventually go there uh yeah uh, and i think cody's asking how to make it kind of like maybe interface with the community more make it more alive mm -hmm. and keep growing without getting burnt out and you know um whatnot yeah that's probably there's um i wish i was that kind of business mind like seth godin man if you ever see that guy live in action um his his ideas are instant. I went to like a, a town hall thing in New York City with him where strangers would stand up and say, uh, I've got this idea for a dog food business, but I don't know what to do. What do you think I should do? And without missing a beat, he's like, here's what you need to do. Da, 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 da. And it was just like, it was breathtaking. It was like, that's a great idea. Oh my God, that was off the top of his head. 
And the next person would stand up and ask a question about something completely different. And he'd say, yeah, here's an idea. Da, da, da. And again, I was like, fuck, that was brilliant. Oh my God, he's doing that live. It was like watching a master jazz improviser, right? Like, like maybe I could play a solo that brilliant, but with much, you know, composition and thought, but for the a brilliant improviser just does that live. So sorry, I'm uh, not that kind of business mind that could come up with a great idea for Peter right now. Sorry, yeah, Kevin. No, yeah, no, I don't, th <laughs> I don't think, I don't think it's so much that, you know, uh, that, that is needed. There's something I remember reading, um, or you speaking about when you were doing CD Baby, and sorry, this is going entrepreneurial, but I think you do this in your own life of uh, where you tried to do something, but people didn't want that. Mm. That's not what people wanted. You were, and so there was this aspect of listening to people. And I think there's a balance there of like having an idea, but then also listening to actually what people want and what people are telling you to do. And right. like, there's a balance there too. And so like, maybe I just want to keep harking on this. Like, man, it's, it's hard to have one identity when there's this other whole opposite side. And how you do that in a daily life and really maintain that balance without just like toppling over in this dance. Right. Well, it helps to know, okay, so a music teacher when I was a teenager told me something that, that I found interesting. He felt it was crucial. He said like, this is the most important thing you need to know. He said, before you go out into the music business, you need to know what approach you're taking. Are you going to please the industry or are you going to please yourself? And I said, well, both. And he said, no, you need to pick, you need to choose. Like ultimately it's going to come down to that if, uh, you know, this or that decision. Um, he said, because if you're going to please the industry, you can study the billboard top hits and you can figure out how to make a hit and you can figure out how to get rich. Or you can decide that that ultimately doesn't matter that much to you. And you're gonna just make the music you wanna make. And if it makes some money, that's fine. If it's able to support you and pay for your cost of living, that's great. And if anything more than that is just dessert. Um, so it depends on Peter's intentions too. Like um, he may feel like, you know what? It, it may even be that the Stoa loses money each month, but he says, you know what? I, this is worth it to me. Like some people have a hobby where they spend money on bicycles and go on bike trips. Some people buy ping pong tables. I'm spending my time and money on the stoa because I enjoy doing this, even if it loses money. Um, so yeah, it depends with intentions too. Like there are, uh, yeah, all of us have things that we do not for the money and we just yeah. choose that this is what we like doing. Not every, I actually kind of hate the monetization of everything. I hate that, um, that every good idea needs to immediately have this like, okay, how can we monetize this? Um, and I, I resist that a lot by keeping things super like DIY technically. Like when you go to my website, it's like SIVE.RS. It's just this bare bones static HTML because I'm like, no, I'm not gonna go into that hole of filling it with JavaScript and stuff that's going to make it expensive to run and I don't have employees and all of that because then I'd have to ask the question of how to monetize this. Um, but yeah, so maybe, I don't know, Peter, if you're feeling the same way about the Stoa, like you're just gonna do this no matter what. Yeah, one thing uh, I recall reading your book, I read it years ago, but I got a sense. Um, it's like you were just doing it for fun, number one. And then anytime something came to you, like some shit hit the fan, you use that as a forcing function to create some policies or whatever. And it's not like you have this top down thing going on. And I also got a sense that like you could end it anytime and be cool with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, literally. Um, I did, always, I, I had some weird paranoid fear. I can tell you guys now, the old CD Baby logo, uh, the original CD Baby logo, I had actually scanned it off of a Hallmark card because it was just something I was just doing in my living room. So there was a funny picture of a baby face going like that on a Hallmark card. So I scanned the Hallmark card and I put it inside, I Photoshopped it with layering into the whole of my CD. And that was the logo. So I was always scared that Hallmark was going to find this out and sue my ass to the ground. And so it kind of felt like at any point, this whole thing could shut down. And I, I had to always be okay with that. Um, yeah. We all know the stoicism comparison there. We don't need to say that blatantly. Yeah, I, was, I was trying to fish for it, but I, don't know, <laughs> I, wasn't gonna, I didn't want to be obvious. Um, all right, Jess, you had some questions. I have a bunch of questions, but I'll just pick the last one that I wrote. Um, 
which is uh, you've talked a bunch about this um, kind of refusing to choose philosophy. Um, and that's something I really admire because um, like uh, I've been trying to do that in my own life. Like I um, quit a job last year and was try I've been trying to build something new. And it's basically been like this refusing to pick any one thing. A friend said something, I asked her what she was gonna do. And she said, I'm gonna live well every day for the rest of my life. And I guess the question is like, how do you, if that's the way that you live, first of all, I guess, is there a way that that connects to your spiritual self, spiritual practice or anything? And also how do you know if you're like, like moment by moment or day by day, like how do you know if you're kind of going wildly off base in relation to that? Like, how do you know if you're accidentally falling into some trap and what kinds of like traps are they? Hmm. Um. I'm going to answer sideways. There's a interesting quote I heard recently, which is um, an open mind like an open mouth needs to eventually close on something. And when I heard that, I went, Ooh, Oh God, that's good. Cause like sometimes I am too open-minded, which then made me kind of reflect on, well, what does that mean? Too open-minded. It's like, well, you're too open-minded when you never decide on anything, when you just are always leaving all options open, um, you can do that to a fault. And I really like that thing we do in English where you could say like any positive thing and you could say to a fault. Somebody could be generous to a fault, um, sweet to a fault and open-minded to a fault, which means always open, never deciding. Um, and I heard that the, the Latin root of the word decide, the, I think the D-E-C in there means cut, to, like to cut off other options. We need to decide things. So, um, so I think that this idea of I'm always just going to do whatever I want, um, it could be a rationalization for not deciding something. Um, and I guess you don't, nobody ever needs to decide anything until you find out that it's actually getting in the way of what you want most. So I often think about this dichotomy, but like what you want now versus what you want most. Like what I want now is chocolate all the time. What I want most is to be healthy. Uh, so if I only were to observe the now and have chocolate all the time, it would uh, it would hurt what I want most. And you know, there's always a metaphorical version of that. Like it's fun to just do what we want every day, but that's kind of a shallow happy. And sometimes the deeper rewards come from not following your daily impulses and doing what you want most. Um, that's how I think of it. There are lots of things I do in a day that I don't really want to do today, but I know that that's what I want most. Does that make sense? That, or did that help? I think I kind of answered yeah, sideways by accident. Yeah, I guess um, it's not, also not so much about like whether or not you follow like any given impulse, but also like whether or, or how you make sure to include all of the aspects of yourself in a full life. Like Ooh. all of that. that. That's kind of the thing I'm, I'm, referring to like like for me it's like right now I don't have a guitar and there's some part of me that isn't really awake because the guitar is on the wrong side of the country mm. you know or, or that's I mean, that's a very literal expression no that's great I, I, yeah, I as you can tell I like those little metaphors <laughs> yeah. um uh it's funny I'm okay you guys are you know I'm not here to promote anything so please don't think that I'm saying this for any self-promotional reason but I'm I'm still writing my next book called How to Live. And uh, it, it's totally up your alley, you plural, everybody in the top row, because uh, it's the, um, the whole, the, the idea, it's so much fun. Sorry, I, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna pause. You'll see it has to come full circle to what you're just saying. There's a book called Some by David Eagleman, uh, Some spelled S-U-M, and it's, probably my single favorite book of all time because I think the format is so brilliant because it's 40 little short stories. The subtitle is uh, 40 Tales from the Afterlives. And every little short story be, uh, answers the question of what happens when you die. Wait, did, Cody, did you just hold it up? Did we just... <laughs> um, so um, every little short story inside, every chapter answers what happens when you die. But every chapter disagrees with all of the others. So it's like chapter three, Here's what happens when you die. You awake and you're surrounded by these little creatures. Blah, 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 blah. Chapter four, when you die, 
you were in a giant empty mansion and nobody's there and you walk for days. Chapter nine, when you die, uh, you were immediately accosted by you. Know, so I love this format of answering the same question a bunch of times in deliberately conflicting ways. And I read the book twice over two years. And then suddenly while driving down the road, I went, oh, I want to write a book called How to Live that's going to steal his format. It, every chapter is going to be completely convinced that it has the answer on how to live. And it's going to say, here's how to live. Uh, 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 freedom. Freedom is how to live that all misery comes from um, attachments that you don't want. We always need to be free and independent at all times. And here is how to do it. Here's a recipe for the most independent free life. And this is how you should live. Uh, next chapter, here's how to live, commit. <laughs> all great things in life come from committing, from the deeper happiness of being rooted, committing to a person, committing to the mastery path of a, of a career, committing to uh, a place, committing to people. And each chapter is completely convinced that it has the right answer. Um, it's a blast to write. So with that said, my full circle is that uh, last week I was just writing the balance chapter. It was like, here's how to live, balance. Like, look at, look at the balance of nature, the balance of this, like all, um, all these adjectives about when somebody's crazy, we say that they're imbalanced or that they're off balance or that they're, um, uh, you know, all happiness, all good, the good life is a balanced life. But so in the concrete how to live this way, it was about using the clock as your ally, like a hunter uses his hunting dog to let the clock um, aid you in your balance. Because if we just let our um, desires run their course, then we end up doing too much of what makes us happy. Um, we do not enough of the things that we need to do, but uh, don't make us happy in the moment. And so therefore, if you acknowledge these different aspects of your personality that need to be balanced, your different needs, uh, public versus private, your need, everybody has a human need for certainty, but we all have a human need for uncertainty. And those are clashing things, but you need to acknowledge both of them. And what most people do is they swing their lives in this pendulum where they follow one path for a few years and they say, hey man, I'm just, I'm gonna quit my job and go completely nomadic. And it's because they've had too much certainty in their life, no offense. And um, so, they, so they go the, all the way to the other side because they say, I've been ignoring this aspect of my personality. So they go 100% to this other one, but now they're imbalanced again. Now there's like too much uncertainty. And after a couple of years they go, oh, I just need a little more root in this. So instead the balance chapter is, uh, saying that you have to use the clock to acknowledge um, the clock and the calendar to schedule your need for uncertainty, your need for certainty, your need to make music, your need to learn, your need to create and express yourself. Um, yeah, Th that's how my balance chapter would answer that. Schedules. Awesome. Thank you, Jess. Uh, well, Victor, you had some plus ones if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Victor, maybe he disappeared. Um, I, okay. I see Victor, but I can't hear him. Um, okay. Asked to unmute you. You go. Okay. Yeah, there you go. There uh, go. Okay. Cool. Hey, Derek. Hi. Yeah, I was intrigued by the, uh, um, the title of this session. And so I thought, oh, just ask the direct and easy question, which is like, tell us in what way you see entrepreneurialism as a spiritual practice, because um, oh. that landed really strong with me. Uh, oh. And I'm interested to hear your take. Oh, uh, let me try to make up a take then. <laughs> um, let me think. Uh, hmm. Do I? I don't know. Um, I never, you know, I, I only recently realized that the word spiritual has the word spirit in there, which seems to imply that like some, some ghosty thing. Um, and so I, now I'm suddenly like unsure if I ever knew what that word meant. I also just 
yesterday I found out the definition of the word pithy. I'd been called pithy for years. And I, I, with pith, I think of the inside of wood and it's just like this really lightweight thing. And so every time somebody called me pithy, I thought they kind of meant I was an airhead. I thought, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> I guess I'm an airhead if everybody says so. And then just yesterday I looked it up and it said, you know, like powerful and profound. I went, oh. Uh, so now I don't know, spiritual. Uh, I'm not sure if I know what that means, but um, entrepreneurism uh, or entrepreneurship and spiritualism. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't know. If, you, if there's a variation on that question, if you want to ask like a slightly different angle that I might be able to say something about, if you want. Uh, now I'm beginning to wonder if like I made up the title. Or maybe <laughs> I got it wrong. No, I think but, I also so, saw that so, just before. It's not no, your fault. No, okay. Well then. It's, like, it's my, my fault, technically. <laughs> I'll, 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 like, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try out a practice here, which is like the, the collective uh, presencing practice where I sit with something for just a second, get uncomfortable and spit out whatever comes. So what's it like coming into a space that you're unfamiliar with and uncertain about what expectations might pre-exist your arrival? Ooh, it, you have to have this confidence that you can do this. Um, yeah, that's, that, there's like a deep, I'm thinking about this with parenting because my kid is eight and how to instill this feeling of like, I can handle this no matter what happens, you know, terrible things happen. Uh, I can handle this. Uh, I'm entering into something I've never done before. I can handle this. Um, somebody I love just died. I can handle this. Um, thinking of like what, I feel like I'm, I need a, um, almost like a little mantra there that I could help instill into his head. Um, it's a funny thing, like having a kid and, and um, thinking of how you can influence them. So ever since he was born, I sing him lullabies every night. And one time when he was um, about three years old, um, I was singing the usual lullabies. I would sing him Blackbird and Hey Jude and Over the Rainbow and Yesterday. So it's like some Beatles, just things I felt like had a nice singy melody. And I thought, wait a minute. I've, I'm a songwriter. I've written over a hundred songs. I can put an idea into his head. Like, let me sing, let me think, put things into his subconscious. So I made up a song for him one night that went, uh, whatever scares you go do it. Whatever scares you go do it. Whatever scares you go do it because then you won't be scared anymore, won't be scared anymore, won't be scared anymore until you are then. Whatever scares you, go do it. Whatever, you know, repeat, repeat. Um, and I, I've been doing that since he was two. So now whenever we're out and playing, and he's about to, you know, climb up the tree really high. And he goes, I'm scared. And I always go, whatever scares you. And he goes, go do it. <laughs> and he, it's like, yeah, that's in there now. Um, so, yeah, entering into something you, entering into something completely unknown. Um, I might have an answer to your entrepreneur question now, a minute later. Um, I think I think of entrepreneurship differently than a lot of people seem to because um, I wasn't trying to be an entrepreneur. Um, people started calling me that later. I was really, to me, it was like a charitable thing I was doing. Um, I mean, I, again, sorry, I'm not pushing books, but I, in my book called Anything You Want um, about like how I started my company, um, I didn't realize till other people told me so, but um, the whole way that I was approaching it was like, I had already made a good living as a musician. Like I was already, I already bought a house in Woodstock with the money I made touring. Like by my own definition, I was already successful. And so then I built this little web store to sell my CD. I just did this for myself. But then my friends in New York City that were musicians started asking me like, hey man, could you sell my CD through your thing. 
So as a favor to my friends, I started selling their CD and I took no money for doing it. It was just like, I just did it as a favor. And then friends of friends, and then strangers started calling. It's like, weren't even a friend of a friend. They just heard of it from someone and they started sending me their music. So I, I picked a price, like I set an amount that would just kind of pay for my time. But I still thought that of this, like as my community service, um, like the world has been good to me. It's time I give something back. And yeah, I was just doing this the way that some people would volunteer at a soup kitchen or something. And then it got really popular and became a full-time job and I had to hire somebody to help me do it and so on. Um, so the whole time I never thought of it as like, that narrative that people put around this thing, like, how'd you get the confidence to quit your job and start a business and believe in your dreams? I'm like, mm, none of that, none of that applied. I just, I was just helping my friends. So I do think there's something to that though, of putting yourself out into the world um, to offer your help, to like just be a public servant and help what people seem to need help with. Um, whether that's a service or a product or th something that people need help with, you just, you're there to help. And I think if you switch your focus from how can I make money, me, 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 you flip that and say, all right, this is, forget me. I don't care about me. How can I help you guys? What's up? What, what do you need? Um, that doing that switch of mindset seems to be very rewarding. Like the world rewards you for switching that. So if you want to call that kind of spiritual, maybe. Cool. Um, and, and if you don't mind, Derek, if I can use that lullaby for the next intro music for the next event, uh, I would appreciate that. <laughs> Someone in the chat says uh, we should have a meta modern lullaby Stoa album. So maybe. Yes. <laughs> oh, you know what? Hey, wait, you guys are the, the best audience. One of my like little whimsical ideas I had once, it's like, oh man, I, I, I got kind of close to thinking we should really do this. Um, what do you guys think of. Uh, of this idea that that if somebody's Jewish, they can go, if they need some wisdom, they go talk to their rabbi, right? If somebody's Catholic, I guess they can go uh, into the confession box and talk to the priest. It's not just for confession. You can like get wisdom from the, the wise elder. But those of us that like stoicism, we don't have like a sage that we can turn to, right? So what if we make a like stoic sage um as a as a service like almost like a num a phone number you could call and it doesn't necessarily mean that that it needs to be one brilliant genius on the receiving end it could be like all of us um like collectively kind of being your highest self and and channeling the the best wisdom you've heard um because even when I years ago like 16 years ago I hired a like a life coach type person. Um, and I only found out later that this dude was like younger than me and had had no particular success in life, but he was a great coach for me because when I would call him with a problem, he would just channel the wisdom that he had read through books. He was basically just kind of echoing what he heard through books, but by being a little bit separated from it, he didn't know me. We'd never even seen each other. He was just a, a phone call I would make. Um, I would tell him what was up, a problem I was wrestling with. And he'd say, hmm, what about this? And he'd give an approach that was just something he had heard. So I thought of, yeah, Stoic Sage as a service, uh, a wisdom hotline, whether it's an email address or a phone call or a live chat, when you're feeling stuck with something and you want to know what the Stoic Sage would say, we can all channel our Stoic wisdom. Yeah, I, I love it. It's sort of like the, the collective part, like the next Buddha is the Sangha or like a decentralized psychotherapy. You know, someone mm. comes in and all this meta Stoics just kind of give them love and wisdom. I like it. Uh, so yeah, lullabies too. We'll make up a stoic lullaby album to put healthy thoughts into the next generation's heads. So, yeah. Not yet. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Pranab, you're up next. Cool. Um, I had two questions. Which one should I pick? Yeah, I guess on your about page, you have a list of all these different kind of traits and um, behaviors that you kind of prefer that are kind of against the norm or against what people typically think of as accepted. Uh, I guess, how did you kind of decide on those and how long did it take you to really accept those things as a part of, your, as, as a part of yourself? Mm. Um, or were there some things that were more difficult to accept than others? And kind of how did you, what was your process like to, you know, find yourself, <laughs> I guess? 
decades of pain and shame. <laughs> um, no, that's seriously like you're looking at like I'm 51 now. That's like decades of slowly admitting my tastes and preferences and catching a lot of shit for it and people getting mad about it and me either realizing I was in the wrong or saying no, it's just I see I I seem to just want something that's different from what most people want. Um and the about page was actually a, a bit of like an an outing of myself, Peter, you used that word earlier. Um, I outed myself in many ways, especially like the most despicable one in there that I'm still okay with is that I'm not into my family. Like I don't love my parents. Um, and when people hear that, they think, oh, something's wrong with you. You need to go see a shrink. I'm like, I don't know. It took decades before just saying, no, nothing's wrong with me. I just, um, I just don't love my parents and I never did, not even as a little kid. I just don't feel any connection with them. And since putting that out into the world, I've heard from some other people uh, that feel the same way. And it's so liberating for them to read that, like, oh my God, you too. Like, and you know, they reach out and say, God, it's so nice to talk to somebody that feels this way because all my friends give me so much shit for not loving my family and tell me something's wrong with me. But um, uh, by the way, when I say my family, I mean like my parents, not like my kid. I love my kid. But if someday my kid says he doesn't love me, then I would get it. Um, so yeah, so sorry, I think it's just been like, you know, decades on earth and like slowly admitting things that are, seem to be here to stay that are just my tendencies. Um, which, you know, it doesn't mean they're unchangeable. In fact, lots of things change, but I guess we all have our, that's the nature and nurture balance, right? We have our nature and then sometimes nurture can change your nature. It's kind of what cognitive behavioral therapy is about, like kind of rational thoughts can actually change the irrational emotions underneath them sometimes. Um, yeah, anyway, tangent. Sorry, did that help? That was cool, thanks. <laughs> All right, uh, Katrina, you had some questions. Yes, hi everyone. Um, first, Derek, thank you so much for the very sweet lullaby i the moment i heard it, i was like i can go do anything i want right now i feel so oh. like hypnotized <laughs> by this um so i love that you did that for us thank you um so the the context of the questions that i'm asking um is basically like i'm 26 right now and uh in your 20s you, you seek to find yourself and i did something recently where i hired a coach for myself and you had mentioned that you hired a coach for yourself too and that's what inspired this question and i remember um in making that decision there was some shame in it like i should know how to do what i want to do I, should, I read all the books i follow all the blogs like there's this wealth of self of productivity information on the internet like why am i getting stuck um and then finally i was like i just need help um, so in hiring a coach and also finding really wonderful communities on the internet, like these really great Zoom communities, I feel like that has been the shifting point for me in getting out of my own head. Um, so I guess I would, I really would love to hear if there are any particular stories in your life um, in which, uh, well, the, the specific question was, what has been one of the most important ways that you've asked for help from others? Um, and or uh, what are some of the most impactful communities that you've been part of that have helped you in life? Cool. Um, well, I think what we're doing here is amazing. Um, I don't think I'm any smarter than anybody here. I just think it's, uh, I'm flattered that you guys asked me to be in the, the answer role, but I would, before Peter and I like unmuted and went public, I was telling him that I'm psyched to be here because honestly, I would be the, I love this community so much and what you guys are doing that I'd be happy to just be on that other end. I'm pointing to my camera to get behind it. Um, but, okay, so the asking help thing. Okay, so the, the idea that I said earlier about the like stoic sage as a service, um, the idea that any of us could do that um, because the most helpful thing is to get the opinion of somebody who's not in your head because in your head, it is like a giant tangle of billions of little thoughts and considerations that are going into any given decision you're trying to make or what should I do? It's like mixed in with a billion things, right? But then when you, first the act of having to turn it into a question, I'm, I'm like making it smaller here, that like to turn this jumble of stuff into a question that you ask of somebody else, just that process is huge, hugely helpful. Um, 
to say like, okay, if I had to describe this to somebody else, what's the actual question? So um, computer programmers do this thing. Sometimes it's called rubber ducking. If you search the web, you could probably read a description of uh, more thoughts on it. So rubber ducking was called that because um, a couple famous programmers said that they actually put a rubber duck on their monitor, on their computer monitor. So when they get stuck, they have to explain it to the rubber duck. All right, ducky, here's the problem. I don't know how to get it. And in just the act of having to describe it even to a rubber duck helps. But now being on the receiving end of that, um, it's always easier to give advice to your, to somebody else than it is to take it yourself, right? So um, if all those things, that big jumble of things in your head that's making you feel lost and confused, if you were somebody else asking yourself uh, that question, it would be easy for you to give that person advice. You'd say what to do because you're not in that jumble of thoughts. Um, it's easier to see what somebody else should be doing um, when you're not in there in the mess of tangled thoughts. So um, yeah, I think that asking almost anybody for help or for feedback, especially someone that doesn't know you well. That's what I really like about this idea about the rabbi. Um, even years ago before I'd heard of stoicism, I always liked that idea of like, because I lived in New York City for years and I, you know, there were like these like Jewish communities, I, I had a clear picture of the rabbi that I would go to for wisdom. Um, so whenever I'd get stuck, I'd often think like, what would the rabbi say? And so there's like this little rabbi in my head that is basically busy and disinterested and just like, all right, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you two minutes. What's the problem? <laughs> and I have to like tell him my problem in two minutes. I don't have time for the details. What, what is it? Uh, and I have to reduce it down to that. And of course, if you reduce the problem down to two minutes and you think of like, what would the rabbi say? You know, we can even do that in our heads, but having another person do that is great. So um, when somebody asks my advice on like finding a great mentor or a great life coach, I say, no, you don't need to find a great one. Just any of them, any of those people that are out there calling themselves a life coach, don't, uh, don't hate the fact that they're just a 25-year-old uh, on a beach in Bali that's just looking to make some money by calling themselves a life coach. Sometimes even that can be useful, you know, just telling your problem to a 25-year-old uh, on a beach in Bali that's calling themselves a life coach can be useful. They don't have to be um, a super sage themselves, just describing it to somebody else. And, and even if you disagree with what they say, so sometimes this guy that I hired 16 years ago, um, and I found him just through Tony Robbins' company, right? Like I love Tony Robbins' books, I did back then. Um, so I went to TonyRobbins.com. I clicked coaching. It said, you know, request coaching. And I signed up and they assigned me to some guy. Um, and it was super useful. Um, so yeah, it doesn't even have to be somebody brilliant. So yeah, I think, yeah, remove the stigma. It's about you know, asking for help is a bad thing. I think we should make it more popular to, we should all be asking somebody outside of our own head for help. Cool, thank you. It's a, this might be the last question because we do have to end uh, at the hour. Um, okay, who? Yeah. Anjan, you're up. Derek, I think the most played YouTube video after Rihanna Umbrella is your leadership lessons from uh, Dancing Guy <laughs> uh, for me. Um, I've come back to that year after year and it's often what I show to people. And, it kind of blew my mind um, for, for, um, for those in the audience. Derek is narrating this video at a music festival where this low nut is dancing. Um, and before you know it, by the end of the video, there's an the, everybody is dancing with him and he's made a movement. Um, and Derek, I'm just curious, you had this fantastic takeaway that leadership is over glorified. If you watch the video, it was the first follower um, that was the most important to turning the loan nut into a movement. I'm curious how this principle has like been a part of your thinking and played out in your life since you've made that video. And um, if you changed your mind about any aspects of that. I'm so sorry to have a non-answer for that fun question, especially if it's the last question. But no, um, I basically have almost no thoughts on leadership. Uh, it was, it was a YouTube video that was bouncing around 
the web. It was like on Reddit or something in 2009. I watched it and I went, huh, huh. And then like a little later, I was like, huh, that's kind of like, that's kind of like a metaphor for leadership, wasn't it? I think I had just recently read Malcolm Gladwell's Tipping Point and I had just read Seth Godin's book called Tribes. And um, I have no thoughts on leadership of my own. I was only channeling what I had read in the Tipping Point and Tribes. And I went, huh. I get what's happening here. It was like, because one guy did it, but like really he was just on his own. But once somebody started following him, that's what made other people get up and following. But now look, people came in slowly. And once there were like three or four people, now the people that were standing on the fence feel okay about getting in. So I only had basically three minutes of stuff to say about that. And I wrote a little tiny blog post and then the TED conference put out a call for speakers and I tossed my hat in the ring and they chose that. And um, I did it on stage at TED and I was nervous as hell. And after I did that talk, um, which sorry, this sounds like I'm um, bragging, but uh, it got a standing ovation at TED, which is weird. That only happens about like once a day at TED that they everybody stands up for a speaker. So I was the guy that day and it was really flattering. So after I gave the talk, for the next three days, all of these like literary agents came up to me going, oh my God, you need to turn this into a book. And you know, I wanna, I, you know, we're gonna, I can get you onto the speaking circuit to talk about your leadership lessons. We need to make a book out of this. And I just kind of said no to all of them. I said, I, I have nothing more to say. That was it. I had a three minutes worth of a metaphor to make and that's all I have to say about that. So I said no to all of them. So sorry, um, I don't actually think about it much. <laughs> it was something I did once in 2009 for three minutes and that was that. Um, but uh, I know you guys have to go on the hour of uh, Peter told me in advance, but this is like the, uh, I got to tell you guys, this is like the coolest conversation I've had in a long time. And I fucking love these questions. <laughs> and uh, I kind of wish we could do this for like two more hours. Um, so Peter, maybe we'll do a part two soon. Um, uh, and in the meantime, uh, I'm actually kind of scared. I see that the little chat thing down below says 99 plus, like there were 99 queued up questions. So um, another idea is, you know, my email address is just Derek at Sivers.org. And I actually put aside time every day to answer every email. Um, so please, uh, if you had leftover questions, you didn't get the chance to do here in the whole group, um, please email me. It's actually a lot of my blog posts publicly have come from, people's questions. So um, yeah, it might even turn into a public thing. Um, but yeah, email me anybody that didn't get the chance to ask your question here. Uh, yeah, we can do one more if we got five more minutes. Um, yeah, maybe I'll sneak one in uh, myself. Um, cool. the, you know, there's something like uh, deliciously original about you, like you're you. Um, and I got that sense when I read your book, get the sense now. And I'm wondering if there was a consistent, like maybe call it energy or maybe like a principles that surround that energy when you're an entrepreneur and uh, like what you're doing now, or did your kind of like philosophy or worldviews or principles change with this change of life? Mm. No, definitely. Um, it's, it's hard to figure out why you are the way you are, but um, I think it was just because um, when I was a little kid, we moved around a lot. So um, when I was five years old, we moved. I was I like went to a hippie school in California. When I was five, we moved to England for a year, and everybody called me the American kid. And I just felt like, oh, you, I hate you, English people. I don't like the uh, the way you do things. Your rules don't apply to me. But then I moved back to America, and everybody called me the English kid because I'd picked up the accent. And so now I didn't feel a part of America. I didn't feel a part of England. And then I went to like a uh, kind of a posh high school, but I just wanted to be a heavy metal musician. So everything that my uh, posh high school friends were doing, trying to get into Ivy League schools, I felt like none of this applies to me. I'm just going to be a musician. Um, but then as a musician, I, I felt like I didn't want to be like my other musician friends. I wanted to do my own thing. So I think I, it's probably just a long history of feeling like, um, okay, the thing that you guys are after is not what I'm after. I'm just doing a different thing. Um, so it had nothing to do with the entrepreneur thing that came later. Um, I think this whole approach to life just kind of feels like um, not a part of the game that everybody else seems to be subscribing to. But at the same time, not feeling that, um, I don't think I'm that unique. Uh, I just think of myself as pretty normal, but everybody else says I'm weird. 
Well, whatever you are, I think we all vibe with you. So I think that is a... me too. I love this. I love these <laughs> questions. I really mean like I know that's that's not like a, a kind of a bullshit flattery thing. Like, hey guys, wish I could stay all night. Gotta go. But no, I actually this is uh, the best conversation I've had in a long time. So uh, I'd be happy to come back anytime. And I love these questions, and I love this subject of conversation. So yeah, everybody, yeah. please email me uh, your question if I didn't get to it, and uh, yeah, have me back whenever you want. I'm happy to join. Beautiful. Uh, so I'll circle back with an email, set something up. Everyone's like saying, bring him back, bring him back. Someone even <laughs> privately messaged me. So the consensus is that Derek is distractively, uh, distractingly attractive. And I said, <laughs> I said, I agree. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So we'll do some oh, here, here we'll, we'll end with this. I'm looking out. I should have Peter too. I'm, I'm at the top of a hill in Wellington, New Zealand. So the whole time we've been talking, I'm like looking out at the the glistening ocean. So there's there's distractingly attractive for me. It's Wellington, New Zealand. It's so nice to be here. Um, anyway, sorry. Thanks again for having me. Yeah, we're all gonna come like invade New Zealand on boats. I think after you told me that there's like no COVID thing going on there. Yeah, it's 2019 here. Yeah, sorry, Jess. Life is hard. Yes. All right. So um, we'll plug the, the announcement of the event that's coming up right now. It's uh, you might like this event, that Derek, uh, the Dawn of the Meta Tribe with Tyler Alterman. Um, so there's this sort of like we have a kinetic tribe, people around us in the Meta Tribe, or like people we find on the internet, like find the others on places like the Stoa and whatnot. So that's coming up, um, and and maybe I'll, Jess, do you want to plug your social design club real real brief on Wednesdays? Yes, I do. Um, so tomorrow at uh, one thirty PST, uh, sorry, one thirty EST, which is ten thirty AM uh, PST. Sorry, I'm time zone challenged right now. Uh, it's on the store website. We have the social design club. Um, if you haven't been before. Uh, it's where people who are practicing the craft of social design come together to uh, learn from uh, different systems and to pull designs apart and try and make them better. We have a new format where a presenter comes and we give them uh, a bunch of experts, give critiques, and then the audience tries to beat the experts and, and give better critiques. Uh, tomorrow, we actually have someone who has been working on a game from that I think he did in the Mimetic Mediators a uh, session, uh, which is uh, kind of about steel manning, if you're familiar with that, taking and arguing for the position that's the opposite of your political position. Uh, so if you're interested in coming and giving critiques um, or watching the critiques happen as well, um, that's on tomorrow at 1.30 uh, EST. Beautiful. Uh, all right, so we've got to close this up. There's the store website in the chats, the Patreon, and then the Substack. Uh, Derek, everyone. Mwah. Thank you so much for coming to the store today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> See you again, I hope.